Interest is what we feel when we discover something. Something that speaks to the soul, that pulls us in and wraps itself around the fibres of our being and leaves little room, for a time, for much else. It's not fleeting attentiveness, I describe, that which comes and goes without much thought, like seeing a butterfly floating idly by, capturing the attention until it's flown from sight, leaving one to carry on plainly. No, it's the interest that becomes engrossment that I speak of. That starting point, the basis, that which becomes passion, and from there, obsession. Most of the time these things start at a young age, carried through the formative years by childlike curiosity, before the corruption of the real world can soil the dream. This wasn't the case for me. I was already an adult when I found it. The world had been cruel, callous and uncaring. I didn't really live so much as merely exist in it. Average in every sense of the word, probably below it. My grades in school were enough to get by, but not enough to get into a decent university. It didn't matter much because I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do. I had a girlfriend that I loved deeply for a time, but she's gone now. She left with the only friend I had. I haven't spoken to my family in years. They cast me out due to what they called issues. It's just me. But it's probably for the better. I don't need the distractions. I don't feel the pain anymore. I remember the day I found my purpose. I remember the shadow of the church steeple as I walked down the broken concrete path beside the raw iron fence. The place that was my hometown was a place suspended in the past like the Spanish moss that hung from the cypress trees, fixed there, unmoving. Through an open door I could hear a preacher shouting the normal sermon of fire and brimstone. It made me shudder, but I can't tell you what he was saying exactly. I was just focused on getting to my job at the car dealership. The droning of religious drivel faded behind me, and I kept my eyes down, avoiding the judgmental looks of everyone that thought they knew me as I rounded the cornerstone pillar. I was thinking about the stack of paperwork I was sure was waiting for me, delegated by the crook-tongued salesman, and I knew I wasn't strong enough to refuse to do it. I felt anxious, lost in thought, playing out scenarios in my head where I told them all off and walked out, but I knew it wasn't going to happen. My chest felt constricted, I tried to breathe deeply to fend off the incoming panic attack. I closed my eyes tightly and trudged forward. And that's when I ran into him. Quite literally, I walked into a dark, towering man. I don't remember many of the details. He wore a hat, a thick wool coat that gave off a musty smell, and had a cane. He had icy blue eyes that seemed to glow coldly from the shadows of his face. I remember trying profusely to apologise as I adjusted my backpack straps. I don't know if he heard me, if I was able to get the words out before I felt the knife being jammed into my stomach. I staggered back as he jerked the blade out and I watched the blood oozing from beneath my fingers as I sank to the ground. Tears streamed down my face. I tried to speak but couldn't. My vision was fading and my head swam. But I remember him turning around, casting one last look at me before he disappeared. But the words he said before I fell into unconsciousness. Let us see if you will do. Remember, child, to give back. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. The room was empty. It smelled of metallic sterility and bad food like my high school cafeteria. That in itself was enough to cause a wave of anxiety to wash over me. My entire body ached. I attempted to sit up and felt my breath catch in my throat as a sharp pain shot through my abdomen. Upon pulling back the hospital gown, I saw the staples that ran like snake scales down the left side of my stomach, evidently keeping my entrails from spilling out. A nurse eventually came in, asking me how I felt, and if I had insurance. I told her I didn't. She nodded and explained that a doctor would be with me shortly, 
and that maybe the billing staff and I could arrange a cash payment plan. She left as I again felt the tears welling up in my eyes. I had a little bit of savings, but nothing that could come close to covering a hospital bill. My backpack was laying on a table next to the bed, and I reached for it, searching for my phone to call the car dealership and let them know what had happened, hoping I wouldn't lose my job. I didn't find my phone at first as I dug through the backpack. I did, however, feel something cold, rough and almost slimy to the touch. It seemed to spark as my hand grazed it, and I recoiled with a crushing surge of pain coursing through my stomach again. After another breath, I managed to compose myself, and using a pen, I lifted the flap of the backpack to try and see what was in it. Nestled among work papers was a book. It looked to be bound in some type of black, stained reptilian leather. And, well, maybe I was hallucinating because of the pain medication, but it seemed to glow. Against the wishes of the attending doctor, I checked myself out of the hospital. He suggested I stay, but understood that every hour I spent was increasing a bill I already couldn't afford. I was stable, physically, and that was as good as it was going to get. I hugged tightly to the backpack as they pushed me in a wheelchair to the front door. I didn't have anyone to pick me up, but the lady at the front desk was kind enough to pay for an Uber for me to get home. As I thanked her, I noticed the pity in her eyes. Well, this was a new kind of low, even for me. I dreaded having to get down the stairs to the basement apartment I'd rented. I only made it with the help of the Uber driver once we arrived complete with the same look of pity. I sank down onto my couch and finally texted my boss, telling him what had happened, wondering if I did still have a job. I will talk about it, was the response I got. I dropped the phone and began crying again, unable to stop, and ignoring the pull of the staples in my skin. I cried until I passed out. It was night when I woke, the thin curtains on my tiny windows letting the light of the full moon in. I was hungry, but too sore to eat. The backpack was still by my side, tipped over with the contents half spilled out. The book was still there. The same eerie blue glow, more evident in the darkness. I stared for a long time before I touched it. Again, it sent a spark of chills through me, and I threw it across the room. It bounced off the wall, clattering to the floor and into the shaft of moonlight. I watched in horror as it began to glow even brighter. It appeared to be absorbing the moonlight, flickering, causing strange shadows to grow and move across the walls. The shadows danced erratically, taking shape, melding together, splitting and stretching up to the ceiling. They moved like black water being sloshed in a glass. I thought I could hear a low buzz and felt myself being drawn towards the book. I hadn't even realised that I'd slipped off the couch and was on all fours crawling towards it. I looked down to see the trail of blood dribbling behind me as two of my staples had ripped out. I didn't feel it. I didn't feel anything. I heard a voice as I reached for the book, but I couldn't stop myself. It echoed in my head as my fingertips lightly crossed the binding. It was deafening as I pulled the book towards me, opening it with an explosion of bright yellow light that illuminated my entire apartment, as if the sun itself was shining from the pages. Remember, child, to give back. I didn't leave my apartment for days afterward. I didn't eat, sleep, or even drink. I never felt the urge. I pored over the pages, written in symbols that looked like hieroglyphics. I didn't understand any of it at first, but over time, it became clearer. Every hour that passed, the words began to decipher themselves, and I felt my wound healing. The stables popped out on their own, as if being rejected by my body. And by the time the stab wound was little more than a tiny pink scar, I could read every word. Across the first page, it simply said, The Lost Magic, Book One. There was no introduction, no author, 
no work cited. The pages were yellowed with age, full of what seemed to be spells, curses, charms and rituals. Different methods added by different hands over time, it seemed. I felt a power that I'd never felt before, a thrilling confidence that I'd been resisting. My hands shook as I stood, book in one hand and a red marker from the backpack in the other. I began to draw on the wall. Well, it was hard at first, looking down at the page, then up, eyes flitting back and forth as I slashed the marker against the cheap wood panelling. Eventually, my hand began to move on its own. The book slipped from my grasp and fell to the floor, staying open on the same page, so I didn't look at it. My eyes fell half shut as I swayed back and forth, whipping the marker up and down, hair falling into my eyes, but I was in a trance-like state. I felt as if I was floating as I mumbled my words, stating my needs, what I thought I might give in return. What I desired, what I willed to come true, what I absolutely craved. The marker fell from my hand after the last line was complete. I held my arms wide and tilted my head back. My eyes rolled back into my head and a voice that didn't sound like my own shouted. And so... It shall be. The knock at my door woke me up. It was daylight. I wasn't sure how long I'd been out. I stirred, sluggish at first, but my body felt strong. It was my mind that was hazy. I pushed myself up to my feet as the knocking continued. I walked to the door at the top of the stairs and twisted the locks, pausing before opening it slightly, peering around the corner to see an older man wearing a suit. His voice was friendly enough, but he showed sorrow in his eyes. Hello there. Is there an Aubrey rubbish show that lives here? I blinked, pushed the hair out of my face and nodded. Yeah, I'm Aubrey. Ah, uh, I'm sorry to hear about your loss. You were listed as beneficiary on the life insurance claim. He held out an envelope to me. I took it, confused. I'll leave you alone now. Sorry to disturb you during these times. My office information is in the envelope. Whenever you're feeling up to it, drop by the office and you can sign for the check. He offered a polite smile and turned to leave as I closed the door and locked it. I walked back down the stairs with the envelope, flipping it over a few times before settling on the couch and opening it. Papers slipped out onto my coffee table and I picked them up, unfolded them to see what everything meant. I skimmed over the lines of legal jargon until I got to the line that listed the deceased. I dropped the paper when I saw the name of my ex-girlfriend. Well, initially, I was shocked, but I kept reading. I remembered the talk we'd had when we were together, when she got a new job that offered life insurance, how she said she didn't know who else to list as a beneficiary besides me. Well, I hadn't thought much of it at the time. Maybe there was a mistake and she'd forgotten to change it when she left me. I looked at the paper again. The amount listed would more than cover my medical bills from the stabbing with quite a bit left over. I felt a gnawing feeling come over me then, creeping up from the deepest pit of my stomach, spreading through my body. My breaths came quickly as I turned my gaze towards the wall. The red slashes, marks and patterns were still there. The book still sat on the floor, but it wasn't glowing anymore. It looked like any other book. The sigil of wealth attraction. Well, it had worked. I suppose I should have felt remorse. Should have felt something, anything for the cost. But I didn't. It felt like, well, karmic justice. She'd left me so vulnerable, so shattered. My best wasn't good enough for her, no matter how hard I tried. And now, she was dead, and I was going to be debt-free because of it. I felt better at that moment than I had in years. It didn't take me long to shower and put on clean clothes. I even took the time to style my hair. I had an appointment, after all. Before I walked up the stairs, I looked at the wall, and then to the book, and I smiled. I spent that whole day running errands. I got the check... Pretended to be upset but thankful, and paid off the hospital after depositing it at the bank. 
I'd never seen my account balance so high, even after all of the bills. In celebration, I decided to go out to eat. Oh, the newfound confidence I had was intoxicating. There was a seafood place downtown that I really enjoyed but could rarely afford. It would be a welcome change from the cheap rations I was used to, especially since I literally couldn't remember how long it had been since my last meal. I walked across the street towards a line of weathered brick buildings and neon signs. From the corner of my eye, I thought I could see a figure. Imagination, perhaps. I kept walking. The smell of food was making my mouth water and my stomach rumbled. It was a nice day and the doors were open everywhere. Just before I stepped across the threshold of the restaurant, I felt it. A hand on my shoulder that wrenched me backwards. My feet left the ground and I hung suspended as time slowed all around me and the world grew hazy and translucent. People were paused mid-step. Beer pouring out of a tap ceased midstream, hanging against gravity. It's as if I'd been pulled from the world and into a separate dimension, shielded from human eyes. I realized then that I could move, the hand on my shoulder effortlessly spinning me round. My feet kicked and my hands flailed, but against nothing. The cold blue eyes stared at me from beneath the shadows of a hat brim. The musty smell of wool filled my nostrils. Be calm, child, came a deep voice that filled my head. I stopped struggling and hung there in the nothingness. Good fortune has found you, the voice continued, though I couldn't see a mouth that uttered the words. What do you want? I asked in a panic. What will you give? A token, perhaps, of your appreciation. To show your thanks, to acknowledge us. Well, you must give back, child. Tell me, I shouted in exasperation. We cannot tell you what to give, or else it is not a gift. Do not wait too long, else I'll be undone. I fell then from suspension. The haze swirled about me and was gone by the time my feet hit the ground. I blinked and looked around. The world had come back to life. There was laughter amidst the music, a clatter of dishes somewhere, and the scratching of a chair against the floor. I didn't move for a moment until jolted back to presence by the hostess asking how many in my party. I stumbled over my words before stammering that I would be alone. She nodded and bid me to follow her to a table on the patio. Your server will be right with you. I thanked her as she wandered back through the maze of tables. I sat collecting my thoughts until the waiter came up. I looked at him with his wide smile and couldn't help but smile back, feeling all of a sudden at ease. I don't know why I left my phone number on the receipt next to a generous tip. I normally don't do such things. I'm not that forward. I tried not to think about it as I looked at the objects scattered across my living room. The book was a little help, so I turned to the internet. I needed to construct an altar, or at least I thought I needed to. Give back. Those words kept repeating themselves in my head. I piled flat stones next to the wall where I'd drawn the sigil. Upon them, I placed a large, heavy wooden platter. Next came the candles. <laughs> I felt a bit ridiculous, like I was involved in some stereotypical horror movie, but I didn't know what else to do, and the scar where I'd been stabbed was starting to ache. All must not be undone. I knelt down and lit the candles, attempting to make my offering. Herbs and tobacco, a glass of rum, and a tin of scented oil. I closed my eyes and spoke out in a quiet voice, bidding that who or whatever required the gift took it. The candles flickered and the pain of the wound faded away. I opened my eyes and took a deep breath. It worked. <laughs> that was easy enough. I sighed and went to stand when the pain came back, sudden and sharp, causing me to double over and hit the altar. The glass of rum broke and the liquid ran across the platter, pooling up until I could see what appeared to be two eyes in it, staring at me with disapproval. There was a knock at my door then, and the eyes disappeared. 
I heard a voice calling from the top of the stairs. The pain lessened, and I stood. Hey, Aubrey. Are you here? It's Sam. The waiter from the restaurant. We'd been talking and texting for a couple of days and were supposed to go out on a date. He'd arrived to pick me up. I'd completely forgotten. Oh, yeah. Come on in. I shouted up the stairs as I shuffled into the bathroom. I'll be out in a minute. I looked into the mirror, pushing the hair from my face as I heard the door open and shut, and heard footsteps coming down the stairs. Make yourself at home, I won't be long, I called out as I tried to compose myself, blood beginning to seep from the wound. I rummaged through the drawer and found a bandage, pressing it to my stomach. No hurry, kind of creepy in here, I heard him say. He sounded distracted, and I began to panic again. The altar, the sigil, he was seeing all of it. Maybe he'd ignore it. <laughs> Ow! Shit! I heard him utter then, and the pain in my wound subsided. I felt a surge throughout my body. I stood up then, slowly peeling the bandage back. Everything looked fine. The wound was back to a small pink scar, and the blood was gone. I looked at myself in the mirror, hardly recognizing the face I was looking at as I spoke. Everything all right out there? I asked sweetly. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to be messing with your stuff. I cut my finger on some broken glass you got here. What is all of this? Are you a witch or something? I opened the bathroom door and walked out. The light was dim in the room as the sun was setting. I smiled coyly as I stepped near him. He was holding his bleeding finger, and I reached out, gently taking his hand into mine. I looked at the cut, and then down at the altar. The blood had mixed with the rum in a swirling pool. The flash of an eye shone briefly before figures began to flicker and dance as they had on the walls that first night. I spun him gently, dropping his hand and running one of my own across his back and onto his shoulder. I leaned in then as he tilted his head back, his breath growing quicker, and in his ear I whispered, hmm, something like that. There wasn't much of a struggle as I plunged the scissors from the bathroom drawer into his neck, again and again, the spray of red falling like a soft summer rain. It covered me in a light mist that eventually gathered to run in rivulets down my face and neck. Blood poured onto the altar. He fell, gurgling onto the floor, holding his throat, kicking weakly as the life began to fade from his eyes. The flames of the candles grew until they seemed to lick at the ceiling. I dropped the scissors and leaned over the altar, placing a hand on each side of it, staring at the pool of dancing figures until a face appeared. Blue eyes stared at me from the murk. I offer this as a token of my gratitude. I spoke through clenched teeth. The eyes seemed to grow until I could see a face. Then the face became an entire head. The white teeth were nearly blinding as the head smiled and the eyes gave me a wink. Everything then faded as the candles snuffed themselves out. I felt alive with power. And I liked it. It took days of scrubbing to erase the sign of him from my apartment. His car and body I got rid of that night, down the curve of the levee road into the river at the Dead Man Curve. Uh, if he's ever found it, it'll be like everyone else who's ever driven off of it to be claimed by the dark water. They'll say he was driving too fast, missed the turn. Maybe they'll eventually put up a guardrail. I wasn't worried. No one would suspect a nobody like me of having anything to do with it. No one would probably ever believe I was ever at that fancy of a restaurant to begin with. What I wanted to focus on was the book, to maintain the power. I read through it over and over again until I believed I'd found a way to harness the magic, to wield it without elaborate ritual. Of course, I'd need to give it back, but I had an idea. I picked up the marker and stood before the wall and an empty panel, and I began to create. I waited until night to ascend the staircase and venture into the world. 
I felt good and I looked good. I was essentially a new person, and I carried myself with a grace I didn't think was possible. There was the slightest bit of breeze that caused the branches of the cypress trees to sway as I walked beneath the arches they made on the edge of town. Any other time in my life, I'd have been terrified, afraid something would be spat from the depths of night to take me. But no more. I didn't feel fear. I felt as though the night would bend to my will. It was a high that was addictive. It wasn't long until I saw the house, a single pitiful beam of light spilling from a window. The bedroom window. I knew that place well. I watched through the pane of glass, standing in the vegetable garden. Oh, how she loved her gardening. The figure walked back and forth, alternating between sitting on the edge of the bed and a chair in front of a television. I lifted my hand, cupping it to my mouth like a microphone for my experiment. I whispered his name. Kevin. He jerked his head up and began looking around the room. I smiled behind my hand as he shrugged and settled again. Kevin, I whispered once more, causing him to shoot up to his feet. I stepped backwards as I saw him approach the window, slipping around the corner of a small tool shed and out of sight. I glanced around the corner to see him turn, shaking his head and walking to his closet. He opened it and pulled a pistol down off of the top shelf. I recognized it. It was the same one he'd wanted for so long, the one I'd seen him dream about, the one I'd saved money for so long so that I could give it to him on his birthday, before he stole her from me, back when we were still friends. I wound my way back through the garden, sitting with my back against the wall of the house beneath the window. I closed my eyes and let my thoughts drift back through time. I thought about when we were young, Two awkward children who protected each other from the bullies. We played together, laughed together, told each other secrets, and grew together. As he came into his own as a young man, we began to drift apart. But that was all right. We were still dear friends. I wrapped my arms around my chest as I sat there, hugging myself tightly and gently rocking back and forth. I could hear light sobbing from inside. I thought about how happy I was when I met her, and couldn't wait to introduce the two of them. Oh, the look on their faces, how much it hurt when I realized there was something going on when I wasn't around. The anguish I felt, the shame that I couldn't bring myself to confront them. The look of pity they gave me when they knew that I knew but wouldn't say it. The utter devastation when they both walked away together, leaving me behind. My eyes were squeezed shut hard against the tear that threatened to trickle down my face as I remembered everything. How unbearable the pain had been, how I'd thought about killing myself just so it would stop. I was making him feeling it. He was feeling it all as I had. The physical and mental strain that haunted me all that time. How broken I was, seeing no way out. I didn't look back when I heard the gunshot. The third of a body against the floor was all the confirmation I needed. When I opened my eyes, they were dry, and I felt like a weight had been lifted. How satisfying it was that he finally felt it all just as I had. That his last moments were moments of grief, confusion, and a feeling that nothing could help. I took a deep breath as I pushed up and away from the wall, and I walked back into the darkness, spinning with my arms held out letting the night wrap around me like a shroud. I smiled and laughed as it took me. This was my destiny. It was getting late, I thought. Dawn wouldn't be too far away. Still, I'd need to pay for the power, for the favor, and that was all right. The path I chose to take home would lead right by the preacher's house, and I knew he lived alone. And that was how it all started. No one looks at me with pity in their eyes anymore. If anything, it's now envy. Envy of the boldness with which I carry myself. The aura of strength that I exude. The supreme confidence with which I speak. No one feels sorry for me anymore. Now they wish they were me. Well, obviously, I had to leave my hometown. 
In order to fly, I had to leave the nest, so to speak, but not before leaving my mouth. I hear rumours from time to time of something worse than evil that lives there. I've got much better at the whole thing. I've even managed to find more of the books. Turns out it's a set. A long, ancient set that has been added to by various cultures for thousands of years. It shouldn't exist, but it does, and I've made it my mission to complete it. It's become my passion, my obsession, my quest to find the real magic. The spirits guide me, and I hope will continue to do so as long as I remember to give something back. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.